Well, well, good afternoon. This is a rather unusual time for us to have our seminar, but nonetheless, um, very welcome to this week's Monday seminar. I'm Steve Sang, and um, I'm director of the Source China Institute. And we have a fantastic speaker today from Canada who will be talking to us on a very important subject. Many of you who have been interested in developments in China will have noticed that since 2013, with the issue of document number nine, China under Xi Jinping had banned certain concepts, including civil society. So in a sense, it has banned what the subject of this afternoon seminar is about. It has banned contentious politics, not supposed to happen. We are supposed to have a harmonious society in China now. So our speaker will talk to us on the very subject of contentious contentious politics in China under Xi Jinping's rule. And she is Professor Lynette Ong. She is an Associate Professor of Political Science at the University of Toronto. She started her academic career as a, an N. Wang postdoctoral fellow at Harvard University. And she had also, when she is not at Toronto, spent time visiting institutions like in China, Be Peking University and Fudan University and in North America, Harvard. She is the author of a really first class book, Prosper or Perish, Credit and Fiscal Systems in Rural China, which came out in 2012, I think the year when Xi Jinping became leader of China. I'm not sure which was the more important matter at the publication of the book or Xi Jinping become, becoming leader of the Communist Party. But with that, let me hand it over to you, Lynette, and then we will have uh, discussions after you share your thoughts with us. Over to you. Okay, um, can everyone hear me okay? All right, great. Uh, thank you, Steve, for the introduction. Uh, very, it's really my honor to be here presenting my working paper with uh, my graduate student, Kevin Lowe. Um, yes, we are going to talk about contentious politics in, in China, drawing on uh, data, a, da a data set that we have been building on protests in China that happened over the last 15 years or so. We are also going to be drawing on uh, publicly available state, uh, state statistics on uh, public security spending. So, so this is the context of our paper. And also what motivates our paper is that we know that political landscape in China under Xi Jinping's rule has actually undergone an autocratic turn in really various dimensions and various aspects. Um, there has been increased state control and intensified uh, repressive instruments in terms of ideology. We have heard about, you know, China dream, Xi Jinping thought a lot of um, resources and funding has been given to universities to study ideology because ideology is one of the ways that the state legitimizes its rule. Um, increased restriction on how civil society works, basically shrinking the space in which civil society could operate. Uh, we also see, you know, um, in establishment of CCP institutions within private sector and private enterprises. There has been a lot of talk on urban grid and social credit system for surveillance purposes. There has been curtailment of labor rights. A lot of la labor rights activists have been rounded up. And also you know, equally important coverage on uh, religious and uh, ethnic minorities repression, particularly concentration camp being built in Xinjiang. But on top of all those repression, um, there's also been slowing economic growth and growing unemployment in some parts of, of, of the country. And surely that has an impact independently on on protest activities, independent of repression. 
So given this mirad of, uh, of things going on in, in, chi in China under Xi Jinping's rule, how do citizens then respond to these changing political and economic environments? So that is what motivated our study. Um, so generally, the literature has painted kind of two faces of China's security state. And these two faces are sometimes even contradict each other. Um, people have written about the rise of Chinese security state uh, since Tiananmen. So since 1989, from early 1990s, there has been, there's been quite a lot of evidence uh, if we look at the statistics on uh, public security, we know that the um, funding devoted to public security has actually increased. And then the public security agency has been given increased prominence in terms of their ranking within the bureaucratic system. And since Hu Jintao's second term, that is from 2007 onwards, public security spending has actually increased faster than defense related expenditures. And for the first time in 2010, uh, expenditure on domestic public security has actually exceeded defense ex expenditures. And in, tw in 2016, uh, the gap between them has widened to 13%. At the same time, you know, you have the civil society law being, being passed which restricted uh, civil society activities. But I think this overall picture of uh, increased uh, or the rise of Chinese security state really mask a lot of regional as well as uh, sectoral variation. And, and, and that is what we wanted to contribute to. Uh, we think this overall national level picture might be true, but it actually mask, it might be oversimplifying a lot of regional and sectoral variation. Because first of all, we know that China has actually implemented since uh, 80s and early 90s has implemented fiscal decentralization, meaning that local governments, um, and in this case, provincial and, and county level governments, are actually left to finance their own public securities, right? Uh, left to finance their own uh, salaries for, for the police and how they would then repress or deal with protesters. So you, we are likely to see this uneven public security spending across provinces. So wealthier provinces have more resources to, to, to spend on public security. These provinces also have more resources to, to spend on public goods in general. This includes education, health, healthcare, um, pension, and so forth. Whereas poorer provinces, because they are poorer, they have less of uh, resources to spend on public goods, including public security. So we draw our data from this data set that I've been building for quite some time, which is based on, uh, which protest cases based on media reports. So this is a collection of uh, Chinese as well as Western media on, on the reports of uh, contentious activities in mainland China. And we collect cases from, you know, over a wide range of period, but from on this particular paper, we draw on cases from 2007 onwards, which is the second half of who won period and compare that uh, with cases from 2012 to 2016, which is the first term of Xi Jinping period. So we have four years from who won period and the first four years from Xi Jinping's rule and trying to compare these two periods. And we measure different uh, dimensions of protest according to length, length, participant size, locality, and then the protests are then also broken down into different grievance type, uh, education type of protests, like all oh, the teachers' salaries, ethnic protests, environment, human rights, healthcare, homeowners' protests, um, investment type, investment related type protests, which is really has really mushroomed uh, until recently before it's cracked down, mushroom in the last couple of years in China because of proliferation of P2P or peer-to-peer -peer online platform. 
and some of them went bankrupt. So you see a lot of uh, investors that have lost their lifetime savings then gone out to protest. Labor rights protests, which has been very common since the 90s. Labor protests uh, divided into private sector labor protests and SOE or state-owned enterprise labor protests. Miscarriage of justice, nationalist protests. Uh, protests over police brutality, and that includes, you know, brutality of Chengguan, which is semi semi state or semi formal uh, um, security in in China, in charge of controlling um, street vendors, private matters, taxi and pedicabs, uh, protests over taxes and veterans protests. Uh, this is a um, breakdown of protests according to different grievance type. Um, number of incidents in from 2009 to 12 and 2013 to 2016. If we look at the change in incidents over these two periods, um, overall, you know, uh, education protests have gone up, environment has gone up, homeowners protests have gone up tremendously. And these are protests uh, by individual homeowners against uh, not the local government, but against uh, people, property management companies, companies that actually manage their properties. Let's say if your drainage is not managed properly, if your uh, neighborhood compounds are, are poorly managed and you get a lot of pollution, uh, people will often, homeowners will often complain to property management companies, right? which is a private firm. And these sort of protests have actually uh, proliferated. Human rights protests have also increasingly um, um, increased by 57% over the two periods. Investment related protests, like I've mentioned earlier, the P2P type of uh, investment, a lot of them have gone upside uh, down. That has caused some uh, grievances. Labor protests has also increased marginally. Uh, SOE protests have gone down because under Xi Jinping, there's actually been consolidation of state-owned enterprises, right? So fewer state-owned enterprise reform, so fewer state-owned enterprise uh, labor protests. Uh, police brutality protests has declined, and this is not so much police brutality, but but brutality of Chengguan, which is a semi-informal type of uh, type of uh, um, security that walked around urban urban China and trying to control. Uh, movement of migrant workers, how informal uh, street vendors run their businesses. Uh, they were known to be very violent uh, um, about 10, 15 years ago, but there has been a series of local governance reform that try to image, to try to improve their properties, to try to, Im to improve their, Im their, their governance and the way in, in, in which uh, uh, they are funded. Um, and that has, um, I, I think, overall improved governance of Chengguan. Taxi and pedicabs uh, protest has also declined because there has also been crackdown and reform of the sector. So in the first half of the period, there was the rise of uh, DD and, and you know, um, ordering of cabs during, on, during um, mobile apps. And that has caused a lot of competition to traditional uh, taxi drivers. And hence you see a lot of protests of by taxi drivers in the first first period. Veterans protests there has been no no change. Um, in terms of protest size, has been largely the same ex except you know I think taxi and pedicabs protests have also increased in large in larger size. Uh, investment protests have gone up and land rights protests, even though the numbers have declined slightly, the overall size have in have increased slightly by, by about 25%. In terms of geographical distribution of protests, but there has been an increase in urban located protests. Um, so more protests are being staged in urban areas now, except you know, land and ethnic protests and environmental protests are still concentrated in rural areas. Uh, labor protests are concentrated generally in Pearl River Delta, which is around Guangdong region as well as Yangtze River Delta in Zhejiang and Jiangsu area, which is not surprising because these are the two areas with uh, the, con the highest concentration of uh, factories. Guangdong still ranks highest in terms of land and labor protests. 
and uh, sorry, land and, and, and housing protests. And I'll show you the amount of uh, public security sp uh, spending in Guangdong in a minute, and you could see the correlation between the two. And also interestingly, environmental protests used to concentrate it in more um, wealthier and urban areas, but that is in the last, in the second period has actually extended beyond Guangdong, Zhejiang and Fujian into places even like in the Mongolia, Jiangxi and Sichuan. And I think this is overall kind of the spread of um, increased appreciation for the environment, changing in citizens' uh, attitude towards the environment that, that we have witnessed over the last decade or so. And that is, I think, reflected in increased environmental protests. And like I say, you know, homeowners' protests have been dispersed, you know, throughout different provinces with varying level of development. And again, um, I think that reflects kind of people changing values. Uh, they are more, they are more um, less hesitant these days to bring uh, grievances against uh, property management companies. So if we look through um, throughout, you know, different types of protests. Generally, environmental protests and home ownership protests, they are least, uh, least repressed compared to other types of protests. So they are less sensitive as far as the government is concerned because home ownership protests is generally directed towards private companies. So, so less repressed type of protests have actually gone up quite significantly, right? And spread to other less wealthier provinces. But, but labor protests and ethnic type of protests, which is very heavily repressed, we have seen uh, a decline in numbers. So, you know, different dynamics going on here. Um, this shows you uh, provincial public security spending as a percentage of total government expenditures. So out of total provincial government expenditures, the percentage going to public security. So the percentage going to uh, maintaining public security or, China, or in Chinese is called Wiwen. So I don't know how well you could see this, but let me try to enlarge the, the, the font. Um, so generally, you could see that um, the province spends between four and 8% on public securities. This is the consistent trend th throughout most of the provinces, between four and eight and 8%. Um, uh, Guangdong is an exception. Guangdong in the first, in the Huan period, spent close to 12% in late to, uh, 2010 on public security. Um, Anhui is lower compared to other provinces in terms of how much they spend on public security. So you could see generally that wealthier provinces like Guangdong and, and Beijing uh, spend more than uh, poor provinces like Anhui does. So higher in Beijing, uh, Fujian, Guangdong, and lower in Anhui, Gansu, uh, and Guizhou. So this reflects kind of the nature of fiscal decentralization in China and the fact that public security is locally funded. And if we were to compare the two periods, if we draw kind of 2013 as the dividing line where, when Xi Jinping came, came to power, generally public security spending declined in the second half of Huan era. But then when Xi Jinping came to power, there's generally an uptick. But um, most, in most provinces, even with the uptick, it has never recovered to uh, the, the peak in the Huan period. Right. So even with so much talk and so much energy given to how Xi Jinping has become more repressive, judging from the statistics on, on spending, it has never recovered to Huan, to Huan period. I think the reason is that, the major reason is that Zhou Yongkang was the uh, secretary of, uh, uh, Zhou Yongkang was first of all, Minister of Public Security from 2002 to 2007. He was then made the secretary of the Central Political and Legal Affairs Commission from 2007 to 2012. That is uh, Zheng, Zheng Fa Wei Shuji. So he had a lot of power. 
at the time he wanted to build his empire around public securities. And then he was, he actually made public, public uh, un social unrest da data, right? Saying that, you know, social unrest cases have been increasing in China, which then justifies more resources being devoted to public security. And he was uh, placed under investigation for corruption in 2013 when Xi Jinping came to power because you know, Xi Jinping thought that he was, um, he was in a rival faction and he was being too ambitious. So since then, uh, security spending has actually gone, gone, gone down. Um, and this shows you the same thing, but, but from in a different set of provinces. And overall, you could see that you know, poor provinces, a poor province like Qinghai, public security spending is lower than other provincial trends. Um, an exception is of course in, Xin, in Xinjiang, right? Which has gone up tremendously. Its spending has gone up tremendously since uh, 2014 or so. Uh, Zhejiang has also devoted a lot of resources more so than other provinces to public security spending because it's a wealthier, wealthier province and it, it, could, uh, it could afford it. So a lot of regional variation. And if we talk about national train, it actually masks uh, provincial variation um, uh, significantly. And this, and we were interested in whether what is the function or what is the relationship between public security spending and protest incident, right? So, uh, so does the government spend on public security in order to preempt protests in advance or do they use it to repress protests post hoc? We were interested in the sequence between these two types of relationship. So here we have we lack public security spending. So this is public security in the previous year. And the dependent variable is protest incidents in the current year. And we control for level of urbanization, level of unemployment, population size, GDP per capita and GDP growth. Here we realize that, you know, public security spending in the previous period um, actually has a negative e effect on, on protest in incidents, suggesting that the nature of repression in China is that is actually that of a pre preemptive nature, which means government spend in, spent um, in order to preempt protests, right? Also, interestingly, um, GDP per capita has a positive and as well as significant effect on protest incidents. Right. In a wealthier area, you would imagine uh, society relationship is more complicated and hence you are more likely to see more protests. But then again, if a region experiences high GDP growth, that is able to ameliorate or alleviate the positive relationship between GDP per capita and, uh, and, and protests. So if you want to keep protest level low, uh, this this regression model suggests that a province should spend more on, on public security in advance to preempt protests. Um, if you are a region with high GDP per capita, that is not really within your control. But if you keep GDP growth up, that is able to alleviate the effect of GDP per capita, the, the positive relationship. We thought that was uh, that was that was interesting because there has been a lot of descriptive uh, li literature on on preemptive repression, and here because we combine two two sets of data, we are able to show that uh, repression is really of a preemptive nature in China at, at the provincial level. Um, this shows you the repressive capacity of different regions versus protest incidents. So the x-axis is the ratio of spending on repression or public security over total uh, public expenditures. And this is the protest uh, incidence per capita. So this is, this is a general regional variation. Um, a few things to highlight here. Provinces that fall into this bottom right-hand quadrant 
an obvious one being Xinjiang. The, Xinjiang spends a lot on, uh, on public security, right? You saw the numbers earlier, but he is also able to keep uh, incidents under control, which, which means, you know, generally um, it's uh, money pretty much well, well spent. Yes, it does spend a lot of money more than other provinces do, but it's, it's protest incidents per capita on a per capita basis is also much lower than other provinces. Uh, the flip side of this situation is uh, those provinces or municipality in the top hand quadrant, a province like Guangdong, a municipality like, like, like Beijing, which also spends a lot on public security, but see very high uh, protest incidents per capita, right? And Guangdong is largely because of um, lab labor rights protests, as well as protests over, over, over land. And we know that Guangdong has always had a different context and background. It's traditionally known as a more or less a more rebellious province, um, which the center has traditionally had uh, uh, issue exerting control over. And you know, for those of you who have been to Guangdong and done you know few research in Guangdong, particularly around governance and and protest issues, you know that people in Guangdong behave very differently. They think differently and behave uh, differently. Uh, there's a lot of disdain for authority from coming from from Beijing. There's strong local uh, localism type of attitude going on in that part of China. Uh, and Beijing. Um, there's a lot of protest cases, but it's also important to bear in mind that uh, grievance actually do not necessarily have to originate from Beijing. A lot of people uh, travel from other provinces, far away provinces. They travel to Beijing and stage petition and, and, and stage protests in Beijing because uh, Beijing protests could generally attract the attention of central level officials, right? So you see more protests in, Be in Beijing doesn't mean that Beijing is more Luan than other provinces. It just means that other people, uh, people from other parts of China go to Beijing to protest. Um, in this left hand, left top quadrant, uh, these are provinces who do not have a lot of money lies in the Mongolia to spend on, on protests. They decide not to spend a lot, but, but protest incidents are, are also quite uh, high or relatively high. Um, top left and quadrant, which is most provinces fall under, relatively speaking, they do not spend a lot on, on protest repression. Uh, they also do not have a lot of protests and obvious incidents being unhui, right? These are generally uh, poorer provinces. Uh, this shows you uh, repressive capacity versus protest size. Um, you know, slightly different dynamics. For Xinjiang is more or less the same and Guangdong's uh, uh, location or, or geographical, I mean, in, in, the, in the, its spot in the two axes are more or less the same. Beijing, as you could see, um, in terms of, if you measure it in terms of protest size, its size is relatively smaller, but in terms of protest incidents, it was high up here, right? And, un, and Anhui in terms of protest size is, is, is higher, but in terms of protest incidents, it was low down here. Um, so, so, you know, that tells you different um, relationship between protest and repressive capacity. Now, let me let me end with this slide on uh, what does this tell us about Xi Jinping's rule? Is there a Xi Jinping effect? Um, we know that you know under Xi Jinping's rule, Chinese governance has actually taken an autocratic turn. But protest has not actually declined, just judging by numbers alone, right? Um, and in terms of increased repression, like we hear and read from, from media and social media every day, uh, that is actually not reflected in the data at all. Or put more, more precisely, I think data suggests that, more fine-grained data suggests that there's actually a great deal of variation in terms of uh, repression in China. In places like Xinjiang, it has definitely gone up tremendously. 
places like Guangdong and, and Zhejiang uh, devote more resources to, to repression because they could afford to do so. But by and large, most of the provinces which are relatively poor, they actually don't have that much resources to devote to repression or public goods in general. And public security is, is seen as uh, one of the many forms of uh, public goods provision. Like I say, a great deal of regional variation is quite difficult to generalize. There's been quite a bit of sectoral variation too. Um, and we are doing, we are conducting, you know, more analysis and more investigation into sectoral uh, variation. But I think it suffice it to say that, you know, in different sectors, I think protesters in different sectors face different political opportunity, right? And yes, we have increased repression, but there's also slowing economic growth. And slowing economic growth, you know, affects some sectors more than other sectors. You can imagine some sectors such as labor might actually benefit from slowing economic growth, right? Because you know, there's, there's, there's kind of fewer economic activities going, going on on the one hand. So you would imagine factory size might actually shrink, factory numbers uh, might, might actually shrink, but also those existing factories might have trouble paying their workers and then more workers would then go out and, and, and stage protests. Uh, slow economic growth definitely has a dampening effect on labor, or sorry, on land rights type of protests because slowing economic growth generally means slowing uh, construction activities. Fewer, fewer construction, fewer land grabs and therefore fewer land related type of protests. Um, sectoral governance reform have been implemented in Chengguan in, uh, in P2P investment platforms that has been um, clamped down by, by the central government. And hence, we also see fewer protests in those sectors because of governance reform. Um, and of course, like all data, our data is subject to some measurement issues, like all media related data. Um, it is biased. Generally, there is a bias towards urban type of protests because reporters tend to have more access on more access to protests in urban localities. Uh, reporters also tend to pay more attention to larger protests. So smaller protests may be missed and under reported. Um, but I think we source our data from different, um, different sources. And I think overall, we are able to, to balance out some of these, uh, these uh, measurement uh, issues. Um, and I think a big question mark here, in, as far as contentious uh, politics is concerned in China, a big wild card is where is the economy go, uh, going, right? And I think slowing economic growth in China, which is more of a structural issue, uh, will have a major determinant over the direction of, of uh, protests. And I think you know increased repression applies really um, it definitely applies to Xinjiang and in other region, um, there is there is the type of repression, at least reflected in the in the numbers that I have shown you, have not actually increased that that uh, tremendously. Um, and I think with the pandemic, it has hit some groups more than other groups, such as you know migrant workers more than other other uh, sectors. Um, let me just end with the other word of caution, which is um, repression in China. What I've shown you is repression that could actually be measured, which is in terms of public security spending. But there are other types of repression in China. A lot of it is not reflected in numbers. For instance, um, the state might actually mobilize you know, neighborhood committees and state-owned enterprise managers to um, exert influence over protesters that work in that unit or live in that neighborhood to convince them to not go out to the street to protest, right? There has been quite a bit of literature on this type of relational or, in, or informal type of uh, repression. I've written some, some, some about, about this sort of repression too. So this sort of repression is not easily measured in, in a quantitative sense. 
And I think that sort of repression might actually be ramped up even though overall spending in public security has not increased all that much. So this is the other hand that, that, that this is the other side of the picture that I think we, we, we need to pay attention to. And this is something that is not captured by statistics. So I will end here and I look very much forward to your questions. Well, thank you very much, Lynette. That was a fantastic talk. I think extremely interesting data that you will have share with us and very interesting observations as well. We already have a good number of questions in the Q&A box. Um, before I open it to the floor, I would certainly like to uh, use the privilege of the chair and ask your question first. But before that, let me just remind everybody that if you would like to ask a question, it would be helpful if you could indicate who you are, but if you would prefer your identities to be kept secret. Just say so, and the confidentiality will be respected. But it will be helpful for me to know um, whether you are a, an academic colleague from somewhere else, or whether you're a student, and whether you're undergraduate or PhD student. Give us a better sense of where the question is coming from. Now, Lynette, let me start off by asking you about your um, very, very interesting data set on the grievance types. Because I, I, I found something very interesting in the data you provided. In terms of the ethnic labor, police brutality, and taxi pedicabs categories, they've all in fact fallen. They were, they were in negative territories. Uh, ethnic, yes, um, labor rights and police brutality, correct, correct. And taxi cab too? Yes, correct. Now, what does that actually tell us? I mean, particularly, if some, something like taxi cab seems to sort of stand out as a separate one, but when we are looking at the ethnic, the labor and the police brutality categories. And given that we know in general terms of the increase in repression under Xi Jinping compared to the Hu Jintao era, right. you would expect that there would be more complaints in these categories, not less complaints in these categories. Right. Um, um, so the, the fact that they are significantly negative requires an explanation. What does it tell us? Does it mean that, for example, the repression was actually effective? Therefore, there is a sort of intimidating uh, effect. And right. therefore, people raise less issues. Is that right? Or is there something else, something much more important? Yeah, you know, this is one area that we, we, that we are trying to, to, to look closer into. Um, taxi and pedicabs, um, as well as police brutality with respect to Chengguan. Uh, this is because of um, governance reform in the Chengguan sector. So under Xi Jinping, Chengguan is better paid. Uh, there was an economist article, I think just two, three weeks ago that talks about Chengguan, right? Um, they used to be very violent um, and this would just openly beat up street vendors some 10, 15 years ago. But in the last five years, their image has actually improved. They are better paid, they are, they are better trained and better funded. Um, and I think that, so that might be a, a supply side issue too. In terms of taxi and pedicabs, um, in the Huan period, it, it, that was the beginning of a uh, mobile app. Uh, you could order, you know, DD through mobile app. So a lot of taxi drivers felt increased competition, right? So, so they went out and, 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 and staged protests, usually coordinating with other taxi drivers within the same, same uh, city. But I think in the last couple of years, the government has also tried to control that sort of protest and then uh, control how, how uh, licenses were, were given in, 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 uh, in the different municipalities. So, so that has led to a decline. So a lot of it is, I think if we see decline, 
is actually a result of supply side issue, which is uh, which is governance reform in that particular sector, not necessarily increased, not necessarily because of increased repression. SOE re reform, I would say that you know that is because of lesser SOE uh, shutdown, uh, and and just lesser SOE reform in general under Xi Jinping, right? Uh, in fact, Xi Jinping is trying to build the SOE sector, so less. Um, Less uh, protests, ethnic uh, ethnic related protests. I think you. I think that is related to repression, like 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 what you have pointed out earlier. Um, lesser protests being staged by Uyghurs and other ethnic minorities because the government has actually kept a closer eye on 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 those uh, ethnic minorities people. Yes. So you know a range of reasons. Okay. Let me move on to the questions that have um, come in through the Q&A box. It's a question from uh, Dr. Jeanette Liao from the University of Dundee. Her question, having thank you for your enlightened, enlightening talk, her question is that it's very interesting to see the figures you have presented over the public security spending versus economic levels which seems to have differed from common sense, which would assume that in poor regions, people would tend to protest more often. The preemptive repression model may explain this lower frequency of protests in richer areas, but can it explain what has happened in the poorer regions? The example of Xinjiang seems to suggest that such kinds of spending is also closely related to the central government's policy. Yes, uh, you know that's a great, great question, and I think there are several things going on here. Um, I think you know overall, protest is. I would say that, you know protest in general tends to happen in wealthier areas because social relationship. In wealthier areas are more are more complex, right? Um, there's more there's more there's more factories, uh, there's more economic activities, and if governance is not improved, more activities means that there's greater opportunities for conflicts to occur between citizen groups as well as between state and society, and I think even from descriptive statistics, we could see that, uh, um, you know, even you could say that, you know, um, counter common sense, um, against, against common sense, uh, protests tends to happen in, in, in uh, wealthier, in wealthier areas. Um, so if we talk about, if we talk about when, when, when there's an economic shock, Right when there's uh, when 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 we have economic crisis, a lot of people turn out to protest, and I think that is different if you were to compare a bunch of regions in terms of economic uh, disparity. If you have an economic shock, I think if you have a one shock effect, that 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 sort of shock will generally stimulate people to protest more. But that is different from comparing provinces with uh, different um, uh, protest level. Um, and the other dimension of the other question that she asked, I I don't I don't remember. But 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 anyway, so I hope I have addressed the gist of it. Unless you know, um, Steve rem remembers the second part of Janet's question. I, we have quite a few questions, so I I would okay. I would move on. Sure. Um, the next one I would like you to address is one from one of our PhD students, Melia. How, and she would like to ask you to what extent has censorship impact on your data collection process, which is based on Chinese media report? Question mark. Do you spot any pattern of certain topics becoming so called sensitive over the years? Yes, uh, you know, very, very, you know, sensible and good question. Um, so the prot the data here stops in about 2015. Um, I haven't shown you the data after 2015 because there are so far fewer cases after that. 
I think, you know, um, the, the central government really took a hard rein over protest incidents reporting in the second half of Xi Jinping period. In the first, in the first half, we still read quite, quite a lot about, about protest cases. So there was um, rounding up of people collecting, you know, protest uh, statistics. Uh, there's a guy in Sichuan and a couple that has been collecting data on Weibo. Those people were, were thrown into jail in the last couple of years. So we were lucky that in the first half, we were still able to collect, um, collect uh, incidents. Um, in terms of where we collect our, our cases, we, our sources came from a range of media, uh, such as, you know, uh, Boshun, uh, Radio Free Asia. These are mostly um, Western organization or, or dissident organizations that have, you know, um, presence in China, if not in Hong Kong. And some of them have, re have reporters based in China or rely on eyewitness account and eyewitness uh, reporting of, of incidents. So, you know, multiple sources and multiple ways in which uh, they collect data. Have a related question uh, from a colleague based at the Norwegian Institute for Defense Research, Nine Marie Brandstrand. The question is: You say that um, the research is based on media reports. Is this also including social media posts? I would have thought that reporting on protest would be sensitive in and of itself. Thus, there would also be quite a lot of pressure to avoid such reporting, wouldn't it? Yes, um, so this, uh, my data set is uh, sourced from, um, from websites. They are not social media. And there is actually quite a bit of distinction between, between them. Uh, Website depends on two types of, of accounts, on reporters reporting, as well as eyewitness account, right? So if my land has been grabbed, I went out to protest, I might, I might, I might report to a website to say that, you know, I saw protests of 50 people about, about land. But social media posts, is only based on eyewitness ac account. So the, the, uh, the, the way in which reporting was done is differs between these two types of sources. The other thing that I would say about, um, I would, about social media posts is that you actually, so people who work on social media data, you see them reporting on large number of protest incidents, but typically a lot less information on each case. Because people, typically when people post on Weibo and social media, they, they report less information, typically about grievance and protest size and location, that's it. But we have been able to measure different dimensions of protests, including, you know, differentiating where people are from and where they stage protests. Uh, because we use data from websites that has a full reports of protest incidents. So, you know, there are some, some significant uh, differences between these, these two sources. But, you know, I have, we have cross-checked cross our, our trends as well as descriptive statistics um, with people like Jennifer Pan from Stanford who work on social media data. Generally, two sets of data show similar trends in, in terms of way social uh, unrest has been heading in the last couple of years. Okay, I'm changing directions completely. And this is a question from Dr. Sin Liud from the University of Central Lancaster. And the question is that you, sorry, your data compares the last four years of the Hu Jintao Wen Jiabao administration with the first four years of the Xi Jinping administration. Do you think the picture would look different if you are comparing Xi Jinping's second term? In other words, the first four, ye the first four years of Xi Jinping's second term, which is still unfolding. 
Right. But I think the question is, are you comparing like with like when you're comparing the last four years of Hu Jintao with the first four years of Xi Jinping? Right. Um, good question. So our, our motivation was to compare uh, how much Xi Jinping has actually changed compared to Hu Wen period, which is his predecessor, right? Um, we we don't have data for, um, at least not shown here, data for the last couple, last four years. So if you were to ask me how is protest like in the last four years, I, I will have to speculate. Um, and I can tell you that just looking at raw numbers, protests have declined tremendously. Um, and I think a lot of that might be due to censorship uh, issue. Uh, we know that, you know, there's no... American reporters uh, based in, in China anymore. No American, no Australian reporters based in Mandan China. Um, even domestic reporters have find it increasingly difficult to report on something like, like protests. And I think this much harsher environment uh, really took place since about four years ago, uh, since 2015 which is not reflected on the data. Um, so a lot, more, a lot more difficult to get uh, protest cases now. And uh, partly for that reason, we actually stopped in, at the end of Xi Jinping's first, first term, where data was still relatively available. This is not a follow-up uh, from Dr. Liu, it's a follow-up from me. You said the data become much more difficult to gather into the third year of Xi Jinping's first term. What is your sense of why it got so much more difficult at that point? Or why is it so much more repressive at that point? Um, I think the central leadership has gone just more paranoid about, about, about protests. I think, I think generally, Chinese administration pre Xi Jinping have seen protests as, as having providing two sides of the coin. One is it is uh, an expression of grievance, but it is also a way for central leadership to keep pulse of the society. You know, the way people are unhappy, why they are unhappy, and the scale of the problem. But I think this current administration's attitude towards protests is. They don't even want to know where the problem is, right? They just want to uh, keep a lid on it, keep a very, very tight, tight lip on it. So, 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 so you have these two phases of what, two different functions of what protests are supposed to serve. And under current leadership, increasingly so, uh, they want to forget about um, the informational function of protest. They just want to focus everything on the grievance uh, dimension of protest. And for an authoritarian regime, it is not good for the people to express their, their grievance, period. And I think, I think that is at least my sense of why, uh, you know, it's increasingly difficult to get protest data. Okay, thank you. So question from one of our PhD students, Johannes Kako, can you tell us more about the nature of veterans' protest in terms of location, size, and demands, please? Yes, uh, good question. Um, there has been quite a bit of uh, veterans' protests, and my understanding is uh, there has been reform going on uh, in the in the in the military. So veterans, I think, they used to be able to draw uh, resources from all sorts of economic activities that they are allowed to run uh, after after they re they retired. Uh, there are organizations that could that could run economic activities and then could draw some of the revenue. Um, that has been reformed quite significantly um, in the last couple of years. So, so you know, those pocket money or extra funding has has dried up, um, and I think a lot of veterans are unhappy because they they the formal pensions that they draw are not sufficient uh, to finance uh, their livelihood. 
with skyrocketing uh, inflation rate and 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 cost of living in China. So it's a case of increasing expenses, but dwindling revenue because of what is going on in that in that sector. And veterans' protest is typically um, quite politically sensitive in China because they are seen as regime insiders, right? So for you know Chinese scholars who have done uh, a lot of interview work on veterans protests, veterans are able to use a lot of emotional tactics to draw sympathy to their plight, not unlike you know what SOE protesters do in the late '90s when SOE were shut down, a, a lot of in, a lot of them were underreformed in the Dongbei area, right? Um, SOE workers like veterans felt that they have been cheated by the system because they contribute their lives and their, their, their youth to the country and to the enterprises. But when, uh, but when they get old, the system or the government doesn't, re doesn't really take care of them. Is that, is, that's, is that sort of sentiment that gives rise to a lot of emotions and hence it typically attracts a lot of uh, sympathy. Okay, let's move to a somewhat a rather different subject which is a, a question from Matt Kennedy. Um, how has the relationship between the party, presumably the party central, and the provinces have evolved under Xi Jinping in comparison to that under Hu Jintao? The changing relationship between the party and the provinces. Um, and I and I suppose that your question is um, directed to is with respect to uh, public security spending, right? Um, well, I can't tell you because I'm yeah. not Matthew Kennedy. Right. Um, I think the gist, my understanding of it, the gist is really the relationship between the party central and the provinces, and was there significant changes? between the Hu Jintao era and the Xi Jinping era, if there were significant changes, what were those changes? Whether it's security or something else. Right. Um, what I could tell you that is that, at least my general impression, um, um, in terms of political control, there has been political centralization. We know that Xi Jinping has with his anti-corruption campaign has actually taken a lot of you know people out of the system and some of them include provincial governors and provincial party secretaries right i charge them with with uh with uh corruption and then take them out of the system and put in place his own people in those places so so i think in terms of political control the center is now able to control province more effectively than before so so short so shorter leash and tighter control of central over provinces. But in terms of physical uh, or economic control, um, I think China is still relatively speaking a physically decentralized place. Public goods provision is still largely provided for by provincial governments or, lo or local governments, even though in some areas such as you know, healthcare, uh, it has benefited from central transfers. But I think it's still generally the case that public goods provision, including public security, varies across regions because of uh, the gaps in between provinces. Wealthier areas have more money to spend on public goods, and poorer provinces have fewer resources to, to, to spend. Okay, let's move on. And this next question comes from one of our postgraduate students. Uh, Sylvia Prusina. The question is She would like to hear your opinions about whether protest incidents have ever had or may have in the future any discernible outcomes on government policy. Do protests make a difference? Yes, uh, that's an interesting question. This is, this is about how responsive the government is to protests, right? Um, and before I address your question, this, uh, this you know, goes back to my earlier point that protest actually is not all bad because in a country like China where there's no feedback loop to the government on how 
uh, the society thinks of the government. Protest is a way really to keep power of the society. It's like running a public opinion poll. If there's a lot of protests in some areas, you know that local governments, at least not perhaps not central governments, you know that at least local governments in those regions with a lot of protests uh, are not very popular, right? But when Xi Jinping clamped down on protests, uh, you lose sight of the informational function of uh, of, of, of protests. Um, so people who have studied, um, let's say, land land protests, um, find that there's been a bit of improvement. So there was a lot of. Um, so let me give you a historical example. Um, there was a lot of protest against. Uh, rural taxation and rural exactions in the 90s, um, which actually peaked in late 90s and early 2000s. Right? A lot of large scale and sometimes even violent protests against uh, collection of rural taxes in late 90s. People for, call it, you know, um, uh, they are actually forced to pay taxation greater than their annual income. They just couldn't afford it. This, is, this happened to peasants. When Hu Jintao came to power in 2003, one of the grand, grand policies that he introduced with his, his legacies was abolition of agricultural tax and making a, those rural exactions illegal. So, so, so village governments used to go around villages, knock on people's door and just collect any money they like to finance construction of goods to finance salaries of people working in village government. All of those have been made illegal when Hu Jintao came into power. And that, and that was seen largely in response to protests going on in, in late 90s, which attracted you know, worldwide attention. Even you get reporting in places like, like, like New York Times. So, so in that respect, uh, the government has been responsive. Um, that being said, you know, China being China, you have central government policies, local governments have all sorts of ways to, to get around it. Uh, and some governments still quietly go around and, and collect exactions, that still happens. Um, they find other ways to, find, to finance their public goods and services. But by and large, that sort of blatant collection of illegal exactions have actually stopped because of, uh, of that policies that was introduced, that was largely seen as in response to protests uh, in the previous period. So yes, government has been responsive to some extent. Thank you, very useful. This is a uh, question about data, which I have overlooked earlier. I would have asked them together with the other data questions. And this is from a PhD student from the Free University of Berlin. Shang Huang. The question is, does the data include censored social media contents, such as free Weibo? Right. Uh, no, no, it doesn't. Um, so my data set only includes uh, protest cases reported on by, by, by websites. Um, not collected from social media. Uh, if you look at social media data, you might get protest incidents numbers that are you know ten times multiples of mine. But each protest incident has a lot less information, so mine doesn't include social media. Okay. Next one, I really have to give this one to priority, even though this is the latest questions we have received on the Q and A box. I have to give this. Um, priority because it comes from the youngest of our participants, I believe, is from a year 13 student pre university. And that is Jack Bowen. The question Jack has is that I found your point about the Chinese government's paranoia around protests very interesting. What would you say is behind this paranoia? Well, thank you for your interest, Jack. Um, you know, very good to 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 see you know interest about Chinese politics coming from a young person like you. Um, paranoia. Um, 
I think there are structural reasons, but there are also contingent factors. So let me start with contingent factors, which you might have heard of, um, which has to do with you know uh, personality of uh, Xi Jinping himself, as well as people that he decides to surround him with himself with. Um, I think. I think um, if you look at kind of the biographical data of President Xi, how he rose to power, his family background, the fact that he spent his formative years in the Cultural Revolution, um, in 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 rural areas doing hard hard labor. I think if people do that in the early years, that shaped a certain outlook on their lives, and they'll and the way that they conduct business, right? Um, and I think I imagine myself, if I were to go through that in my teenage years, uh, you look at the world through this tinted glass, which is everything is, is about politics and power. Um, when one has, it's a, a winner take all type of situation. If one has power, one has control over everything. So in his teenage years, because his father uh, was one of the revolutionary deemed as having bad class background, the whole family were thrown into, into uh, doing hard, hard labor in, in rural areas. Um, so I think in his view that having political power is extremely important because it could actually change, your, change the fate in your life. Um, and, and, and one could talk about in more about, about his, his own personality. And, and, and I think, you know, some scholars um, um, in the UK uh, have spent time, you know, looking at, 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 at Xi Jinping's bio, uh, biography, which I won't go, uh, go into that into much details, but in terms of structural reasons, um, I think China has also reached stage where the leadership, this current leadership sees itself as, as kind of powerful enough to exert its authority um, very confidently. That is reflected in its growingly assertive foreign, foreign policy. Uh, but also domestically, I think that is reflected in repression of of Uyghurs in Xinjiang and then of ethnic minorities. I think generally increased repression or this extreme autocratic turn, um, some people could say that, you know, it's because of, you know, terrorism that happened in, 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 in China about 10 years ago, such as bombing in, in train station in Kunming, um, uh, which then justifies government taking harsh actions on ethnic minorities. The analogy here is like after 9-11, uh, the U.S. government felt that it is justified to carry out certain policies on the Middle East and then in the invasion of Afghanistan because they wanted to address uh, Muslim and, and terrorism problem, right? Um, but that could also be seen as an overreaction of terrorism. And the root cause of terrorism uh, could be because, you know, um, the Chinese government has never paid attention to moderate voices, uh, you know, within the society. And these include societies of ethnic uh, minorities when it decided to jail in you know, a moderate uh, in intellectuals like Ilam, like Ilam Toti, the government has never heard of, uh, uh, the grievances of uh, Uyghur people. And, 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 and when you try to silence moderate voices, you tend to get uh, radical voices. Um, and I think the same could be said about, about uh, just majority of, of Chinese society. In the last couple of years, we see shutdown of think tank, more liberal think tank, intellectuals getting silenced, uh, some of them taken out of the system like sacked and they have to run away to the United States. Um, if, I, th I think generally if people are not allowed to, to speak and express their grievance in a mild and moderate manner, uh, sooner or later you get these radical claims uh, emerging. Lynette, can I follow up on that and ask you, when was the last terrorist attack in China or Xinjiang? Uh, Xinjiang, I don't remember the, 
exact year, but my memory tells me that it was about probably about seven to ten to ten years ago. But there were also terrorist acts carried out outside Xinjiang, right? By by Uyghurs in 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 I think Kunming train train station, if I remember correctly. That was the knife attack. Yes, 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 correct. It's a long, very, very long time ago. Just to be paranoid about what happened nearly a decade ago. Sure, sure. sure. I think that was probably behind Jack's question of, isn't that really paranoia, or there's something? If it's not paranoia, what the hell is it? Yeah, no, I. So, like I said, I I believe that they are contingency factor, which is exclusive to this current leadership. Meaning that if you take out this current leadership. In China, if we could actually do so, um, we might see less of a paranoia, right? Less repression. But there, are, I think, also structural reasons uh, going on within China and within the autocratic system. There are two two things going on. Going. Okay, I'll move. I'll move on. There's a question which was kind of echoes what you said a bit earlier about the uh, control over the think tanks. The question is not about think tanks. The question is from uh, who to weigh, and it is in regards to the increase in protests related to education. Has this predominantly been in the higher education sector? And if so, is it for a demand for a reform in education? Yeah, so education type of protests have largely been staged by. Uh, uh, teachers in private schools, and so in Chinese, in Chinese it's called Min Ban Jiao Shi. So a lot of private schools in China, so these are not higher education, they are primary school and secondary school, not government school, private schools, badly run, uh, which then goes on to pay teachers uh, very, very poorly. Um, and um, in the last 10, 15 years, they have been you know, very, very poorly, poorly paid. And you know, um, so you see increased protests in the education sector for that reason. So it's an economic uh, nature grievance. Okay, I have a uh, broad question from Luca Tinirero. In your opinion, does lack of contentious politics damage or boost? the CCP's legitimacy? Um, uh, I have to think because, you know, usually scholars ask, does contentious politics, how does contentious politics affect CCP's legitimacy? When you say lack of contentious politics, I meant that you, I, I take it that you mean um, fewer protest incidents. Um, you know, if, if it's fewer protest incidents in the last couple of years, I think that would definitely, generally, less reports means that you, you would think the Lili's, uh, CCP's leg, uh, legitimacy has been boosted, right? Because there's less report of social unrest and supposedly more social stability. But then again, if you don't allow people to at least express their grievance, uh, they might harbor unexpressed discontentment towards the regime. And I think that cannot be good uh, for the regime's uh, legitimacy. Um, so overall, I, I don't think the conclusion is that clear cut if there is less of contentious ac activities and, and its effect on uh, state legitimacy. Okay, now again, that is not a question from the original question, but it's a, it's a follow up. Which do you think it really matters more? that the party believes in it, or you, as an academic analyst, believe in it, that the relative lack of contentious politics uh, helps with the legitimacy of the party state? Uh, that's my own, that's my own belief, and I don't work, I with, I don't work for the CCP. Um, I know, and, I know, but, yeah. but if, the, if, the, if, the, if the party believes in it as well, right. if the party takes the same view as you do, as an right. academic analyst, does it matter? Yes. Um, if they take the same view as me, then I think they will not spend so much resources in cracking down protests. 
that it is actually good to to let people to let people vent their anger and vent their frustration every uh, but the question is put in the opposite then. way yeah that by being able to contain contentious politics because it, the question question asks it in a negative way rather than the positive in the uh existence of contentious politics is the lack of contentious politics which in this case means the containment of contentious politics does that make the party think that it's more legitimate which it would appear that the party state does feel that it's more makes the party stay more legitimate if there are fewer contentious politics that's why they're spending so much money and resources to contain it um if i think like an autocrat um I would think, you know, if I could control protests, that would boost my legitimacy. Yes, I think I think the lack of contentious ac activities would translate to great uh, perception of of a boost to state legitimacy from people who control it, who people from the perspective of people who like to control. Um, but in my view. Uh, that's that's that view is ero is 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 erroneously held, uh, for the reason I stated earlier. Yeah. Thank you. Next is a question from an undergraduate in politics at KCL in London, King's College London, mm -hmm. and that is from Caitlin Chang. Could you please elaborate a bit? on how you collected the data for the percentage of money spent on public security in each province. Right. I imagine such data is not public. Yes, so we did not collect this data. This data is collected by the Chinese government. So it's available from, you know, on, 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 um, from Chinese uh, statistical yearbook. Uh, and this is reported by provincial government. So provincial government reports how much they spend every year and on what they spend on. And public security uh, is one of the items, right? So we take that number and then, uh, and then we, 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 and we analyze them. We don't have access to, so I have as much access to this government data as everyone else does. Okay, um, next question is from Mauricio Marinini, I would like to hear a little bit more in terms of the qualitative analysis. Will you be able to give us an example of how the same typology of protests, for example, environmental related or land rights protests was handled in two or three different administrations or geographical areas? Um, good question. Um, but I'm not sure whether different regions or, you know, based on scholarly research, different regions actually deal with the same type of protests differently. I can speak about land rights protests because I work on land, land rights protests. Um, typically, because land land rights protests is difficult to organize. Um, first of all, people would go out to, to protest and like environmental protests, it has kind of um, spillable effects, right? You get uh, some factories being, being built, it might affect thousands of families. And then you could mobilize thousands of, fam of families go out to protest. Land rights, it's only then when your land is being grabbed or your house is being illegally demolished, then you have an incentive to protest. So it's specific to the aggrieved individual or aggrieved family. But then again, you cannot go out to protest on your own because you are so weak on your own, right? So typically protest happens when there's a group of people. But then if their land is not being grabbed, what is their incentive to go out to protest? which is why land, land rights protest is difficult to organize and it's very easy to, very easy to crack down. And, and cracking down on land rights protests, uh, some of the repressive measures are not reflected in the numbers. So the numbers might reflect the number of police, resources spent on police to, 
to arrest protesters. But I could tell you that on land rights protests, um, if the village authorities knew, knew that a group of villagers want to stage land, land rights protests, they might go to individual families and first of all, identify families that could be bought. So they'll knock on your door in the middle of, of the night and, and say that, you know, look, see, I, let, let me pay you some extra money if you could promise that uh, you wouldn't go out to protest. So they would buy off individuals in order to reduce the cohesion between the protest groups. And that in a way would reduce the likelihood of the protest. There, there's a lot of clever strategies being deployed by local authorities. And these sort of strategies are often not reflected in, in um, public security spending numbers. Okay. I've got three more questions. I'll try to do them all uh, in the remaining time we have. Next one is from Mark Rapley. In the, is the concept of individual rights an accepted concept within Chinese political discourse? Um, yeah, so I, I'm not a political philosopher and I feel, you know, a, li a little inadequate to answer these, these questions because I'm not able to get a, give you a very elegant answer. But generally, I've, I think Chinese culture, political culture sees, would put kind of collective rights and however you define collective above individual rights. Um, and, and, and this is seen, people who hold these views, are, you know, both Chinese society and Chinese leadership hold these views. So Chinese leadership is able to impose, you know, collective rights, uh, um, impose that, you know, on top of individual rights. So if certain individuals want to express their rights, the government could justify certain policies if that serves the, the better or the good of the, of, of the collectives, even though it might come at the expense of the individuals. Okay, I'll just add a very short rejoinder today, if, if you don't mind, Lynette. Sure. That document number 9, 2013, make it very clear that universal values is prohibited under Xi Jinping. So the question really is, do you see individual human rights as a matter of part of the universal values? If you see so, then it is prohibited. If it's not part of the universal values, then it shouldn't be prohibited. Sure. That means sure. that it's necessarily not, uh, not so. Um, I got a new question that just came in, I think from uh, Vijay Prakash. Doesn't China have a dispute redress system at the village or municipal level, such as civil courts or a complaints system? or protests is the only way left for common people to seek redress or even simple civic issues like land rights or poverty issues. Right, we have audience based on the question from Delhi. From Delhi. Um, uh, there is a petition system. So petition, you could write petition, you could do letter petition or you could do uh, in-person petition. Um, but the petitioning system in a way is as challenging as, as protest. And some would even argue that it's even more challenging because first of all, these, these days, it's since several years ago, there's, there is a, a rule saying that if you live in, let's say a township level, you cannot go to government that is higher than a township to stage petition. So meaning that if you have grievance against your local government, if you live in a township, you have grievance against your, your township government, you have to complain to the township government that are the people you have trouble with, which kind of defeat the purpose, right? So, so they have, the central government has taken people's rights uh, to stage, uh, to uh, petition at a higher administrative level. So it has... Uh, the purpose is very much defeated. But even before that rule came into place, um, local government would often stop people from petitioning. So if you live in the village, you have to take a train or take a bus to Beijing, spend a lot of money going to 
traveled to, to Beijing to stage a petition. Um, local government often send people to take you back. In Chinese, it's called jiefang. So you get stopped at train station. You get kidnapped at train station by some gangsters that they hire and then take you back uh, to you know, put you in some dark black houses for two months, beat you up or something, and then send you back to the village. And you get intimidated and you, you never want to go petitioning again. But that uh, a scholar has done kind of public opinion poll of, of, of people who have been to Beijing to stage petition and have not been to Beijing and what they think about petition system and the perception of, cent of central government. There's a great deal of difference. Uh, people who have been to petition in, Be in Beijing have seen really with their own eyes how, how the system works, actually has reduced um, confidence in central government quite significantly after they make their trip. Okay, thank you. Got two more questions left and three minutes of our time. The next one is very short, so do what you can, and I will read it in full. And this is a question from Cho Chung Tang. Please comment on healthcare. Yeah, I think a lot of healthcare is, is Chinese called Yi Nao, uh, which is healthcare system is overburdened in China. The ratio of doctors to patients are very, very uh, low. So, you know, people are not happy of, of healthcare system. And the way that they protest is they would uh, cause harm to medical providers. So a lot of healthcare protest is of that nature. Okay, thank you. Last question is a uh, second bite of the cherry from Xiang Huang. I have a general impression that the Chinese people are sometimes proud that China is less loan, less chaotic than other developing countries. Could you please kindly share your thoughts about the general public's attitude towards social stability or Yuan Ding? Right, right. I think you're right. I think this this uh, this perception of, of social stability or or Luan goes to the core of you know what addresses the attitude of of, of the, cent the central leadership, and here I will make a distinction between protests and violent protests or even riots. Right, Shao um, Luan. Once a protest turns into a riot, when the government loses control over the Luan, over the stability, then it will actually invite a very harsh crackdown, and in those cases, usually of uh, para, para, paramilitary forces like Wu, Wu Jing. Wu Jing, uh, sending in Wu Jing is often justified when riots happen, right? Um, and this is very different from, uh, from non-violent from non -violent protests. If I could extend the analogy to Hong Kong protests, which, turned, which took a violent turn over the last, last summer, um, then you know, res resulted in, in um, more repressive uh, measures. I think that could be seen as an analogy of what's going on in the mainland. But Steve might have more to say on, on Hong Kong. We can indeed have a lot more discussions about Hong Kong or indeed the way how the People's Armed Police is deployed, whether they are deployed only after um, disturbances have happened or whether they're deployed and as a result of their deployment, so -so and real chaos happened. Um, yeah. But that's really for a different session. Yes, um, yes. Our time is up, and in fact, we have literally just managed to address all the questions that I have seen. And thank you very much, Professor Lynette Oud, for your very, very thoughtful and frank uh, presentation and discussions with us. And also, thank you very much to you all for the uh, very thoughtful and interesting questions that you have put for this forum. I will um, just thank you, you all and uh, hope to see some of you back next Monday at a later time of five o'clock. Thank you thank and goodbye. Thank you so much to Steve and everyone for attending. Thank you.